Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. All right, my friends. Strap in, buckle up, because man, you are in for a treat today. This book right here, Anyone, Not Everyone, Mr. Corey Quinn is in the house. Corey, I am so excited that you're here. David, I cannot wait for our conversation. I'm excited, ready to jump in. So the subtitle of this brilliant book, and everyone just needs to stop, pull over if you're in your car, get off the treadmill. Go to your phone, go to Amazon, wherever you get your favorite book, and you got to get a copy of this. The subtitle is A Proven System to Escape Founder-Led Sales. It's actually a lot more than that, but we'll get to that shortly. Such a fantastic book, Corey. Just for people who might not know you yet, give Mm -hmm. us a quick backstory of your professional journey that brought you to the work that you're doing today and some interesting pit stops along the way. Sure, absolutely. So I've been in the sort of the postgraduate, you know, working world here for about 25 years. I started off in sales and marketing and in entrepreneurship. Quick note that when I was about 22, my best friend and I, we raised six million dollars as two very young, eager entrepreneurs with absolutely no experience. This was back in the dot-com days. We raised all this money to run this big business that we were launching, which was an amazing story. We'll get to maybe some other time. But following that, I I had a career mostly in sales and marketing. I've, I've spent about 17 years in the agency space, which is specifically digital marketing agencies. Started off in sales. And my last in-house role was as the chief marketing officer of a digital marketing agency called Scorpion. And what's interesting about that business, David, is that I started there in 2015. And they were doing about $20 million, which by any definition is a successful business, successful agency. But the founder had an insatiable need or want to be able to really grow the business born out of his desire to help more people. And he had sort of built the business based on hiring all of his friends from the local neighborhood and was able to get it to this very respectable $20 million level. And for whatever reason, the revenue sort of Flatline, the growth wasn't as exciting anymore. And so I came in and, uh, as I mentioned, as the chief marketing officer, and we helped to grow that business from 20 million to 150 million over a, a sh- very short period of six years. And it's during that time that obviously we learned a lot. We made a lot of good moves, made a lot of mistakes, but I learned a lot as far as how to scale a service based business to such heights. And so I've since left that agency. And now I am a consultant and a a growth advisor, if you will, for agencies who want to scale up revenue, who want to get to sort of the next level in their business. And the book itself, Anyone, Not Everyone, was really born out of really a, a blending of all of the experiences I've had to date, but certainly really zeroes in on the few things that really allowed us to scale up this service-based business from 20 million to 150 million, codified it all, and now I've presented it in a way that's easy for anyone to go into the book and be able to go through the chapters and the worksheets and the exercises to be able to get the same outcome as my one-on-one clients do now. Yes, totally amazing. And I do have to say that the book bonuses, the audio book, the work, it's interactive workbook. It's a workbook that has links to other worksheets, training videos, so well done. So as a student of marketing and sales, not only a a teacher and a mentor, it's like, man, this is good. My next book, I'm doing what Corey (laughs) Quinn did. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, That was really, really good. I'm not going to go page by page as much as I would love to. But on page six, you give one of the first major thunderclaps of (laughs) necessary change. Mm -hmm. And it's about getting crystal clear and incredibly narrowly specific on exactly, Mm -hmm. underline exactly three times, exactly Mm -hmm. what you do and exactly who you do it for. So you mentioned Scorpion 2015, digital marketing agency. 
100% focused at that time on personal injury lawyers. Is that correct? Roughly speaking, yes. I wouldn't okay. say 100%, but it was effectively, you know, vast majority of the revenue yeah. was there. Correct. So when people first come to you, Corey, and they say, you know, we do X for Y, and you realize sure. X is as broad as the side of a barn, and Y <laughs> is impossible to define. You can never buy a list. Yeah. You can never find yeah. them on LinkedIn. And they sure. might think, oh, we have a great niche. They've made no decisions about what they do versus what they don't do. And they've made no decisions about who they serve versus who they don't serve. How do you read them the riot act to convince them the power and necessity of this? You know, it's, it's a great question. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you kind of a counterintuitive answer, which is that most founders who find themselves in this situation will do pretty much anything except for narrow their target audience to focus on a specific vertical market. And the reason why is I think we're, we're sort of built as humans to repel this idea of you know, removing market share or potential opportunities, right? If you have inbounds coming in that are not related specifically to this one vertical, that means that you as an agency founder have to, or a service provider has to say, have to say no. And that's very hard for business owners to do. And so I really specialize in focusing on the folks who've been through the ringer, tried everything else. And I've realized that there's just no way that I can move my business forward until I actually focus on one thing, doing serving one audience, becoming the best at the world, serving them by solving a specific problem for them. It's at yes. that point, I can have a great conversation with them. It doesn't matter the amount of data that I can share with them that supports the argument for you know, focusing and narrowing your business on a vertical market, becoming a specialist or an expert. All of the data is there. People typically don't do it unless they're absolutely ready. And the phrase that you have owned now with this book coming out is yeah. deep specialization. Correct. Deep specialization. That's the moniker. We put that bumper sticker on everything. And yeah. that's really one of many force multipliers. But one of the principal, one of the main force yes. multipliers is this concept of deep specialization. Yeah. and the decisions and the focus that you walk people through in the book, so powerful and so necessary. I want to go yeah. back to something because I first heard of you on our friend Greg Hickman's podcast. Yeah. And both in the book and then on that show, you talk about the super networker, the rainmaker, who's yeah. the CEO That's of right. the agency, CEO of the consulting firm, has a huge network. And they build the business on that network and talk yeah. about that situation yeah. and then talk about the opposite of that situation and getting free of that. Sure. So out of my 17 years of experience in the agency space, I started off as a sales guy carrying you know, a leather bag, knocking on doors or not really because we were selling into enterprise level brands doing e-commerce for companies like Lululemon and the Men's Warehouse and Remax and, and Hyundai and all these big brands. And so the way that we built that agency, the founder of that agency was a graduate of the Harvard Business School. And if you're from the United States and you happen to know about HBS, Harvard Business School, you know that it, its network of graduates is sort of legendary, right? You kind of have a one degree or maybe two degree of separation from the CEO of this big company or the CMO of that big company. And as a result of being a graduate, he was able to leverage his amazing professional network and bring deals into us that we would pretty easily close, right? And so that was how that agency was built. The next agency that I went to was also founded by a very charismatic leader who also had an amazing network. So this person happened to be the ex-CEO of MySpace, the old social media network, right? And the way that MySpace makes money is off of, of course, advertisers. So he knew all of the big advertisers, the, the companies with the big budgets. And when he left MySpace, started an agency, he obviously called all of his contacts. And so again, I was in a sales management capacity there. And we were able to build this great, successful agency based again on, this, on his personal network. By the time I was at this point, it was about seven or eight years into my agency experience. And I just kind of came to believe that that's how agencies kind of operated. And you had this charismatic founder, a great network. And it wasn't until I was hired to go work at Scorpion in 2015 as their chief marketing officer 
that I learned something different. I saw something completely different. It was a six-person sales team who there would be an inbound call coming in from an attorney. As you mentioned, it was personal injury attorneys. And on that phone call, they would close the deal with the attorney that was calling in. That salesperson would close them. Of course, they would close the call, stand up, get a big mallet and hit a big metallic gong. And the whole floor, the sales floor would light up and everyone was like sort of high fives all around. It was a really cool environment. But what was interesting was that the attorney who was calling in and agreeing to a 12-month, you know, tens of thousand dollar contract to work with this company called Scorpion, they didn't know who the founder was. And guess what? They didn't ask who the founder was. They didn't care who the founder was. What they cared about was finding a partner, a specialist, legal marketing, who could take them from where they were, which is frustrated, to a, a place where they were having a thriving practice, which of course is what Scorpion was known for at the time. And the insight for me coming from this other background was that you know, vertical specialization is truly a great way to build an agency such that it's not dependent on the founder to be able to grow. And as you know, as I mentioned, and you mentioned, we grew to $150 million. We actually grew to $200 million, raised $100 million from private equity. Very, very successful growth story that did not require the founder to be successful. This would be an excellent time, by the way, to tell everyone (laughs) that I am a Corey Mm -hmm. Quinn client. And I just love the coaching, the mentoring, the structure that you have put together. I am totally drinking the Kool-Aid, my friend, and I appreciate your your friendship and your mentorship. Thank you, David. uh, As I go down this path of deep specialization. One of the things you mentioned that I don't think occurs to really anyone, but it's critically Mm -hmm. important, is you actually have to give a damn about (laughs) your target market. (laughs) And you put it so clearly and so bluntly Talk yeah. about how that shows up yeah. and talk about what we need to look for about, do we actually give a damn about these people that we're dedicated to serving? Yeah. So I think it goes to the term you mentioned earlier, which is called deep specialization. It really has become the centerpiece of, of this book and of this movement, which is that you need a combination of focus, meaning focusing in on a vertical market where you're saying yes to one thing and no to others. That's one piece of deep specialization. The other piece is you need a strategy. This is a massive action plan that gives you a durable advantage, gives you a a unique advantage in the marketplace. And then the third and final piece is empathy. Meaning, and this is the piece that most people get forget or they they overlook, is that you actually have to care about the, the audience that you're serving. Most people who are exploring niching down or exploring this idea of becoming a vertical specialist, they just look for the vertical market with the most people or the most ad spend in terms of you know ad dollars for for marketing agencies, right? And they forget that at the end of the day, these are human beings, right? And it is because we live in this over-communicated world that there are so many agencies targeting, let's say, attorneys, that it's the ones that actually give a damn and that actually care about the businesses that they're serving have a chance to differentiate in a meaningful way in a world where no one really cares, right? And so it becomes a part of your positioning. It becomes a part of your go-to-market that truly sets you apart. And guess what, David? As a result of doing this, your service improves, the quality of your product improves, your attention improves, and your your expertise deepens. And the more you care, the more you spend time in this vertical market. So it becomes a very powerful way to grow your agency. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's back up the truck. Beep, 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 beep. Listen, I have a brand new sales book out there. You got to get your hands on it. It is awesome. It is amazing. It is fantastic. It is useful, practical, actionable, and a ton of bonuses are waiting for you over at doitselling.com. Grab your copy right now and grab all the bonuses, goodies, companion tools, and downloads that go with the book. You'll love it. I guarantee it. Talk a little bit about getting into the head of (laughs) our buyer. And, And as you start this, imagine if we served all kinds of clients. Right. Mm. One day, manufacturing company. Next day, accounting firm. Next day, children's preschool. Listen Mm. to what Corey has to say about getting into the head of your buyer and also scanning your competition. 
What mm. kind of crazy ass job are you making for yourself <laughs> if you're doing this for every possible kind of business? But let's yeah. say that we've chosen a vertical. We need yes. to get to know them and we need to mm. get to know our friendly or not so friendly competition. Talk That's to correct. Them. Yeah. So one of the ways that you become a deep specialist is you truly understand for those businesses that are, let's say, clients that are, in this case, let's say, personal injury attorneys. Let's say you want to focus on personal injury attorneys. You want to understand particularly the reasons how and why they buy from you. What was the process? What were the reasons that caused them to choose you? And probably more importantly, why did they make a change in the first place? And it is through what I call it's common practice, it's customer interviews, to have one-on-one conversations with them. It's through a structured conversation that you ask and you elicit, you try to understand, again, how and why they're buying from you. The challenge that most people make, most founders or marketing teams make, is that they make the assumption that they understand the how and why a buyer or a client may buy from them. But it's only until they actually speak to a client that they either uh, confirm their assumptions or they learn something new. And every single time they're going to, every single time they do a client interview, they're going to learn something about their buyer that they can turn around and put right back into their marketing to attract more of those perfect fit clients. So that's the client interviews. It's absolutely critical. It's actually a best practice taken from the largest companies who do a ton of very client focused work around customer development and whatnot. So this is borrowing from product marketing, these other, these other disciplines that agencies and, and most you know, service firms do not do. So it's the customer interview. You get yeah. deeply into the mind of the consumer. That's and most agencies and yeah. most consultants and most professional services firms, the mistake that I'm sure you hear a lot, I certainly yeah. do, is, Corey, I know their problems. I, I've been exactly. doing this for 20 years. Yeah. I know, I know yeah. why they hire us. You know, we yeah. solve problem X, they come to us because they have problem X. And <laughs> 99% of the time, my friends, you are wrong. You That's are either right. wrong or your surface level or you're missing a right. major, major part of the reason that they came to you, the reason that they were frustrated with some alternatives, the reason that they stuck around and are That's still right. a client today. So you think mm -hmm. you know, but Corey's here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, you don't know. So you got to ask. Yeah. The most well-run, successful companies in the world do this on a regular basis. This isn't something that is made up or, you know, I think is a good idea. It's emulating what other companies who are, you know, ones that everyone else wants to emulate. This is a best practice. And so I encourage agency founders as well as professional service providers to do this. As you said, David, you will be surprised what you learn every time. Big time. That's number one. Number two is you want to do some competitive research as you're beginning to build your positioning and your differentiation, you want to put yourself in the eyes and the shoes of the buyer, the person that you're targeting, you want to attract as a client and try to understand what does the world look like to them as it relates to your competitive landscape. If they're in the market for your services, they have a problem that you solve, you can guarantee that they're looking at your competition. It's just a natural part of the buying process. And so part of this competitor analysis is you want to understand how are your competitors positioning themselves in the marketplace? If everyone is a low-cost leader or, let's say, the best in technology in the space, if they're all touting technology and you also tout technology, well, you're very easily going to be ignored because it's what everyone else says. It is a discipline called category design. And in there, there's a, a tenet or a principle that says that you don't want to compete on better, you want to compete on different, right? And so... It's not that we are also technologically you know, a very sound agency or service provider, but we're different. I'm sorry, we're better. We are actually different because we compete in a different area. So really, the competitive analysis is trying to understand how your competitors positioning themselves to your buyer so that you can find that white space in the market. And in the book, there is a whole bunch of, as you mentioned, processes and worksheets that help you through this. But at the end of the day, you're going to be able to claim some territory in the marketplace, sort of the in the mind of the consumer, if you will, what an area that is confirmed by your customer interviews that they care about, this is something they want, but your competitors are not talking about. And then another thing that your competitors really can't talk about, we hope that they can't talk about it, 
is your point of view, your perspective, yes. your opinions, your recommendations, your biases, yes. right? This is almost like a manifesto that we have to create. What's right. right with the world? What's wrong with the world? What right. what truths are, are we going to be shouting from the rooftops and what myths do we want to bust? This is not a time to be shy or vanilla, correct? Correct. So while doing differentiation and positioning is great in the world of professional services firms and the world of agencies, it's easy for one agency to kind of borrow what the other agency is doing, especially when one agency is really taking off. It's easy to update your website and change your positioning. One thing that's very difficult to emulate is a point of view, and that effectively becomes a durable advantage, as I mentioned earlier. And so what a point of view is in the context of the book and, and the work that I do is you want to have an opinion about the vertical market that you are targeting, that you're, that you're becoming an expert in, and specifically a status quo problem that they are dealing with. Not about the marketing space or professional services. You begin to form an opinion about a challenge that they're, the industry that you're serving that they're facing. I'll give you an example. So there's a great agency by the name of Phaser Marketing, and it's founded by a guy by the name of Luke Eggebrotten. And the cool thing about what they've done is they serve the construction business. And the challenge that's happening in the construction business is that they have a five to two problem, which means that for every five people who are leaving the industry, the construction industry, because of their aging out or whatnot, two people are coming in. And so while there's a tremendous amount of demand today and in the recent history for construction, there's just not enough demand. Well, it turns out that there is, for better or for worse, there is a negative perception of people going into the trades. Everyone wants to go into technology or maybe become an influencer these days or whatever it is, but no one wants to turn a wrench. Well, it turns out that you could make a six-figure income in a couple of years working in the trades, the blue-collar trades. And so they, they're dealing with a very sort of a negative perception. And that's a great example of a status quo problem that Luke's clients, people in the industry are facing. Well, guess what he's done? He's gone and created a nonprofit that gives kids who are leaving high school and going directly into the trades, not going to college, but he, you know, it's money that's being given to these kids going into the trades. He also has a podcast. He wrote a book. And he also speaks on stages to raise awareness about the efficacy and the viability and the just the, the uh, what a great career path is in working in the trade. So part of his positioning is effectively when you work with us, not only are we a specialist and an expert in marketing construction companies, but we're also here to make this bigger status quo problem better. We have a vision for a better future and we're part of making that future real. And so that becomes a really durable, strong competitive positioning when compared to, let's say, another agency that maybe is a generalist and they work with a bunch of different companies or maybe even another agency that focuses in on the construction industry, but isn't fully committed in the way that Luke's company is. And there's a couple things to kind of tying together what you're saying here. The number one, it's being a true champion and advocate for that yes. industry. And then in the book, in the Anyone, Not Everyone book, you say, well, Luke partly made this decision because he just likes blue collar people more. He, you know, I hate to say it, white collar folks, but he's just more comfortable <laughs> talking to his blue collar yeah. buddies. And that's his friend group, and that's his professional group, and that's his client. And guess what? He gives a damn. He actually yes. gives a damn about that's the right. blue collar worker, the blue collar business owner, the blue collar industry of mm -hmm. construction. So he's comfortable there. There's an affinity there, and you can smell it, right? Like when you're talking to a firm that has such a dedication and such a connection with yes. the larger industry as an advocate or a champion. You can just feel it like, oh, there's something different. When I talk to Corey Quinn, there's mm -hmm. there's something different. I've talked to a lot of these other consultants and they're just yeah. after my credit card. But this guy actually cares about yeah. agencies and professional services firms. It's partly your backstory. And you mentioned a couple of, you know, we should examine our connections, right? Is it a familial connection? Is it an expertise connection? Is it an experience connection? That's right. And taking inventory like that, it sounds simple. But I'm telling you, and I'm, I know you know this, we're preaching to each other's choir here. No <laughs> one does this. 
no, no one, one does, does this. this. Yeah. So it's a green, it's green field right now. Oh and my gosh. In, when, when you compete in an industry like professional services firms or agencies where it is very hard for your buyer to differentiate what you do versus the next guy, because they're just not professional buyers in this space. They have a yeah. need and everyone kind of sounds the same. Well, this is a great opportunity for you to truly differentiate yourself with not only the story you're telling, but also evidence of, hey, I've got a nonprofit and here are the kids who've benefited from this. Right. And here's the book that I wrote. It's such a powerful statement about your commitment to the vertical market. Yes, it really is about planting your flag there and loud and proud 24-7. Those are your people. That's your yeah. that's your ecosystem that you're building. That's your gig. That, and and the, I think the interesting thing is there's some people who talk about, well, you want to become a specialist. Okay, well, you can specialize in what you do or in who you serve. And maybe probably a blending of the two. But if I was to choose one or the other, and I'm biased, but I was to choose one or the other, I'm going to focus on specializing and serving a specific market. Because we know that we live in a world, especially today, where there's just such rapid change and technological innovation. You know, There's platforms that are here today, TikTok or whatever, that may be gone tomorrow. And if you position your firm about, you know, about being a, an expert in TikTok videos... In six years, that may be gone, or maybe even six months. Who knows? Whereas right. the construction business, if you become an expert in helping construction businesses in all aspects of growth, then you might have much more of a durable business that doesn't require change and isn't sort of dependent on a lot of uncontrollables like what happens in technology. Yes, I know. Terrific episode here, but... Have you seen our latest web training? Oh my goodness, pop over there right now or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there. Back to the good stuff. Now, another big innovation that people are not going to want to hear, but don't worry, Corey makes it fun. Corey makes it easy. It's an (laughs) eight-letter word. It's not a four-letter word. The eight-letter word is outbound. Yes. Go, oh, no, we're not doing outbound. We got digital marketing. We got blogs, podcasts, SEO, thought leadership marketing. We got books. We got all these things we're talking about. We got a YouTube channel. We have all yet. Outbound is dead. Outbound yeah. is only spammers and goofballs and realtors. Sorry, realtors. <laughs> o- only they use outbound. Outbound yeah. is not worth it. We're just going to sit here and wait for the phone to ring. Please bust that myth for us. Yeah, sure. I believe the stat is only... Three to six percent of your target audience is in the market at any one time. And so if you're in a red ocean type of situation where there's just a tremendous amount of competition, the chances of you getting action on that three to six percent is very, very low. And so what choice do you have besides just depending on inbounds? Well, the reality is that most of the people that you want as clients in your target audience are in what I call the zone of indifference. And the zone of indifference is, I'll I'll explain it with a quick story. So my wife has, as of this recording, we're on the iPhone 15. She has the iPhone 11, okay? And this thing is slow. It crashes all the time. The battery life is garbage, but she doesn't make a change. And the reason why is because she doesn't want to lose the photos that she's accumulated on this phone, which makes perfect sense. Of course, it's not a problem, but she's not ready to make a change because she's worried about this. So the result of this is that she kind of just lives with this problem. Well, the reality is most of the people that you are want to attract as clients are also living with the whatever problem that you solve with their current provider. And it is through effective outbound that when done right, you can actually have a high quality conversation with those people who are in the zone of indifference. They're indifferent about their current solution. In other words, if you do outbound correctly, you can actually have a great high quality conversation with them before they even become competitive. In other words, they haven't even gone into the buying cycle. You've approached them with effective outbound and you're able to hopefully close them. And so it turns out the majority of the people in the market are in that zone of indifference. And it's through one particular way of outbound that I've found extremely effective when it comes to this type of sales approach. So I want to just back up what you're saying with some, yeah. you know, I know you've studied this, you've got data, yeah. but just to popularize this for people, yeah. rain today, 
did a survey. It was a professional services buyers survey, not consultants, but buyers of all kinds of professional services, accounting, legal, consulting, whatever. They found that between 52 and 72% of people, these buyers, were willing to make a switch. Now, they weren't shopping around, to Corey's point, but they meet someone at a networking group, they bump into someone, they find the blog post, they hear someone at a conference or an association meeting. They're like, hey, I want to talk to this guy. So the range is 52 to 72% are willing to switch. Sadly, 72% was lawyers. So again, sorry, lawyers. 52% was management consultants. Then everyone in between there, accountants, engineers, all the different professional services disciplines. But think about that. Between 52 and 72% of buyers are willing to have a conversation with you because they're in that zone of indifference. That's it. Zone of indifference. They're indifferent. Yeah. So they're indifferent and willing to switch. Yeah, willing to switch, but they haven't, it has not gone to the top of their list of to do's. Yeah. You know, humans, we don't like change very much. So if we can avoid it, we will we'll live with yeah. the, uh, the devil, you know, type of thing until it uh, becomes too painful. And at that point, it becomes a competitive situation. You want to stop right. that. You want to get ahead of that. And so there's one particular thing that helped us to really scale Scorpion through Outbound. As I mentioned earlier, it was a six person sales team. Well, that was 100% inbounds. The founder wanted to grow faster than just relying on inbounds. So what did we have to do? We had to go out and build an outbound program. But what we did was very similar to what most people do is what we started, cold, we bought a list off of Zoom Info or, or Dun & Bradstreet at the time. And we just started cold calling. And it wasn't very productive. We wouldn't get a lot of opportunities as, as a result of that. And so we decided to do something different, which was we decided to send gourmet cookies to the attorney ahead of the cold call before they even knew who we were potentially. And what we found was when we sent this overnight package, a FedEx package to the attorney, it would bypass the gatekeeper who was always the one that was giving us a hard time and you know goes right to the decision maker's desk. They'd open it up. They'd have this beautiful experience of a tin of cookies. And these cookies, David, they're not just any kind of cookies. These are amazingly earth shatteringly good cookies. Like you have to like hold the wall like as you're eating these things. You don't want to fall down. <laughs> Inevitably, they would end up in the break room and everyone in the, the law firm would be eating these cookies and saying, well, who brought the amazing cookies? And of course, the word scorpion was bouncing off all the walls. Everyone's like, who's scorpion? I don't know, but they're amazing. And let's talk to them. You know, it's on the... And so by the time the scorpion salesperson would call, it was it went from a, a point of resistance of, well, you know, the attorney's not available to when we called after the cookies, it was, oh, you're the ones that sent the cookies. Hold on, let me put you through, right? And end of the day, as a result of doing this outbound in this way, we call gift-based outbound, we were able to effectively double the size of the business where 100% of the revenue was inbound. Well, eventually it was only 50% of the revenue was inbound. The other 50% was from outbound. And that was the journey from 20 million to 40 million per year. Correct. That, that was, was the that first was, and, and that was step one. That was just getting that was warmed the first up. Step. Exactly. <laughs> so good. So good. That's true. Well, yeah. you know, I mentioned that the subtitle is a little bit deceptive because it says yeah. a proven system to escape founder led sales. It is <laughs> that and a yes. masterclass in marketing. A masterclass in differentiation, a masterclass in sales and sales messaging, and a masterclass in exponential growth. And plus, you get to escape founder-led sales. So, Corey, if people were to take one central idea, one core idea from our chat today, they absolutely have to buy the book. That's the core Mm -hmm. idea I want to share with them. What's the one core takeaway that you would like to leave in folks' minds? I would say that if you are stuck in that founder-led motion, it's likely because you lack focus, you have watered-down positioning, and you really don't have a good strategy for attracting new clients without the founder being central to that. And the best way that I know how to escape from that is to, number one, choose a vertical market that you want to become the best in the world at serving. Number two, get razor-sharp positioning that comes as a result of having this great focus, becomes very clear that you're the best solution in the market. And then develop a strategy that is independent of the founder that leverages one of the 26 different 
channels and tactics that you can take as a business to attract more of those vertical clients. If you do that well, then you can expect a lot of growth in your future. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, I yeah. know that people listening will want to get connected and stay connected <laughs> to more Corey Quinn brilliance. Where can we send people all the yeah. links, all the things? This will also be in the show notes. Where can people go? So the best place I'd love for people to go is go to anyonenoteveryone.com. That's the title of the book. So it should be pretty straightforward. And on that page, you can actually download a free audiobook version of the entire book. And you also get links to the worksheets and the workbooks that you mentioned, David. That's a great place to get a ton of value right away. You can go there right now. The book is also available on Amazon if you prefer a hardcover or a paperback book. That's a great place to go. On my website, which is where the, the book is, you will also get an opportunity to sign up to my newsletter. I also have a podcast called the Deep Specialization Podcast. So if this topic is at all interesting and you want to lean in and learn some more, hear some other voices in the mix, I definitely encourage you to check all of that out. And I second that emotion so much so that I am a fan and I am a student of Mr. Corey Quinn. So thank you so much for sharing your brilliance with us. I appreciate you more than you possibly know. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate the opportunity. This has been awesome. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.